Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Professor Seth Monahan, lifelong music theory geek, and you turned up just in time for video number 11 in my series on classical harmony and counterpoint. Today, we learn all about classical cadences. And to mix things up a bit, I want to start with a joke. But it's not my joke, thankfully. It's Haydn's joke. And it goes like this. Now, I get that you might be wondering what exactly the joke is here, but that's because I haven't given you the context yet, and context is everything. If you're even casually familiar with the classical style, these two chords didn't strike you as remarkable at all. It's just 5-7 going to tonic, it's one of the biggest cliches of the style, and we hear this progression at the end of virtually every single piece of music written during Haydn's lifetime. But that's exactly what makes it humorous, because this isn't from the end of a piece, it's from the beginning. That's the joke. Haydn starts not just a whole string quartet, but a set of six string quartets with a cliché that screams, well, that's the end of that, as if we had somehow walked in late at the very end of a performance. Now, this might not be, like, side-splittingly funny. The 1790s were different times, of course. But it's worth pointing out that one of Haydn's students, a scrappy little mophead named Beethoven, thought this was funny enough to pull the same gag a few years later at the start of his own first symphony. Now, I begin with this example to underscore a point that you may know already on an intuitive level if you're a fan of this music. And that point is that classical music relies heavily on highly conventional forms of musical punctuation and we call those musical punctuation marks cadences. For classical composers, cadences were formulaic ways of signaling musical conclusions. Conclusions of phrases, conclusions of sections, and of course, conclusions of whole pieces. And as we'll see, they involve harmony, but not just harmony. There's also an aspect of rhythm and gesture as well. So to start, we want to get familiar with the two main types of classical cadences. Here is a score reduction of the slow movement for Mozart's C minor wind serenade, composed in 1782 when he was about 26. As it plays, I want you to listen for places where some kind of musical event comes to an obvious conclusion. And then also to see if you can pick out which, if any, feels stronger than one of the others. My hope is that you heard some kind of conclusion at the end of each of the two systems, and maybe also that the second of the two was the stronger one. I picked this excerpt not just because it happens to be achingly beautiful, although it's certainly that, but also because it gives us very clear examples of the two main types of classical cadences. At the end of the first eight bars, Mozart comes to a rest on the dominant chord of the key. We're in E-flat major, so that's a B-flat major triad. This is called a half cadence. It happens when a phrase ends on a root position dominant triad, and the feeling that it gives us is one of open-ended conclusiveness. It tells us that we've finished one musical idea, but it also leaves us waiting for the next one. Now, by contrast, the second eight bars, which are otherwise pretty similar to the first, end with what's called a perfect authentic cadence, or a PAC for short. This cadence is built with a root position 5 or 5-7 chord moving to a root position tonic, usually on a strong beat. And it also requires that the tonic note be in the top melodic voice. You can see that here, Mozart ends on scale degree 1, E-flat, in the highest voice. This is the same kind of cadence Haydn used at the start of his Opus 74 quartets, and its usual function is to signal a much stronger, more definitive kind of closure than the half cadence. A perfect authentic cadence tells us that some musical span has reached a stable conclusion, and that whatever comes next is likely to be something new. Now let's set this passage alongside an excerpt that contrasts in nearly every way except for its cadences. Here is the music Beethoven uses to open the last movement of his second symphony. And it's the diametrical opposite of Mozart. It's slapstick rather than serious. It's jerky and discontinuous rather than flowing and unbroken. But the cadence pattern is the same. The first segment ends with a half cadence, and the second ends with a much more conclusive PAC. <laughs> Thank you. 
There's one other key difference between this passage and the Mozart, and that's the way the composers lead into their half cadences. Now, as the bullet points on screen show, the perfect authentic cadence, the PAC, is a two chord formula. You need a root position five and a root position one. But the half cadence requires only one chord, the dominant. And as you can see from these two excerpts, you can prepare that dominant in all sorts of ways. Beethoven moves into his five directly from tonic with a leaping bass. Whereas Mozart's bass line approaches the dominant chromatically from below, These and many other options are all legitimate ways of setting up a half cadence. Now, in addition to PACs and half cadences, there's one other cadence type in the classical style, and that's a variation on the PAC. It's called the imperfect authentic cadence, or IAC. Like the PAC, the IAC uses a root position 5 moving to a root position tonic. But the difference is that the top voice lands on some note other than tonic. Now, this might seem like a trivial difference, but for classical composers, this is actually kind of a big deal, because we see them using IACs to mark closure that is decidedly weaker than a PAC, but stronger than a half cadence, sort of somewhere in between. And they often put the IAC on a weak beat to make sure it lacks the force of a proper PAC. We get a really clear instance of this at the opening of Beethoven's Eighth Symphony. As you listen, notice how quickly the explosive energy of the opening dissipates with the first eight bars ending on a quiet, rhythmically weak IAC. And I think Beethoven wants us to hear this as an entirely mismatched gesture to the opening, because he immediately insists on a do-over. The music from bar five returns, but now it's in a full-throated forte, and it drives forward to a powerful PAC that's much better suited to the high energy opening. In other words, every sign suggests that he wants us to hear those quiet four bars in the middle as a kind of comedic misfire, one that he quickly corrects by turning the volume back up again. Have a listen. So those are the three cadences you'll need to know and recognize if you're going to get around effectively in the classical style. But a few additional points are necessary here as well. The first, which may surprise students who've done a lot of four-part voice leading, is that in real music, cadential chords are often incomplete. In classical textures, composers often use single notes or bare octaves to represent one or both chords. In the last video, we listened to the very end of the first movement of Schubert's C major symphony. And at the climax, he gives us a huge PAC, followed by a sort of after cadence, or an echo cadence. But the tonic chord here is decidedly incomplete. Instead of C, E, and G, we just have loud C naturals in four octaves. But the effect isn't as if something was missing. It's actually a much heavier, stronger, and more conclusive sound than a full chord would have been. Listen how it goes. For a more extreme case, let's look at the opening of Mozart's E minor violin sonata. Here, he gives us the main theme all by itself in three different octaves, and it ends with a drop from five to one that's obviously intended to sound like or remind us of a perfect authentic cadence. But again, there aren't actually chords to speak of, just B in three octaves falling to E. and that counts as a PAC. Another crucial point here is that cadences aren't made by harmony alone. Context matters. More specifically, it's important to recognize that not every pause in a texture or not every five to one motion is a cadence of some sort. Have a look at the opening of Beethoven's third piano sonata. Here are the first four bars. Now, given what we've just learned, we might be tempted to say here, ah, okay, so we pause briefly on five, that's a half cadence, and then five seven moves to one, so that's an authentic cadence. But I think we'd be wrong. The purpose of cadences is to bring closure to some complete musical idea. And these opening four bars don't even give us one complete musical idea, let alone two. 
For me, and for most analysts, I think, these opening bars present a single idea, repeated with different harmony, to set a larger, more complete musical idea into motion. So those are not cadences. We actually don't get our first cadence till an IAC in bar 8. And notice that Beethoven's plan here is almost exactly the same as the 8th Symphony, which we heard a few slides back. He gives us a weak beat IAC, then reinstates an earlier quiet idea in a more forceful manner, and finally pushes forward to a more definitive PAC. Let's hear the whole excerpt. Now there's another important point to make here as well, and that's that music doesn't always stop to catch its breath after a cadence. Sometimes an authentic cadence elides with a new musical idea so that there's no gap, no dead space between phrases. The end of this example is a very clear case, since the moment of closure in bar 12 is also the beginning of a new theme. Let's listen starting from bar 9, where the main melody comes into the bass voice. Along similar lines, even when a cadence doesn't elide with the next idea, even when there is a little bit of space between them, we don't always get actual silence or a full break in the texture. Very often, there will be melodic filler in one or more voices. Mozart uses this trick in the last movement of his A major piano concerto. At the end of each four-bar unit, the bass voice comes to a stop, making it easy for us to hear a half cadence followed by a PAC. But to keep the energy up, Mozart keeps the top voice moving with scalar lines that lead us continuously into the next phrase. Now after this, Mozart repeats the theme but adds the orchestra. And now notice that the filler at the half cadence is actually much thicker, with multiple moving voices. But still, the sudden halt in the thumping bass notes lets us hear this as a break between units. These past few examples remind us of a crucial point. When you're analyzing real music, looking for cadences, you can't just rely on your eyes. You need to use your ears as well. Being able to hear cadences is one of the most important skills you can develop as a musician interested in the classical style. Now, I don't think anything I've said so far is particularly controversial, but it's time to move into some contested territory. There are a number of ongoing debates about cadences, and I'd like to close by weighing in on just three of these. The first is whether cadences should be used to define phrases. Now, most musicians have some intuitive sense of what a phrase is. And I'd like you to put that to the test by playing you this minuet from a Mozart string quartet and asking you simply, is this one phrase or two? Now, if you're like me, your gut tells you that there are two phrases here, with rhyming openings. But some analysts have argued that we should define phrases as musical ideas that end with cadences. So if you don't have a cadence, you don't have a phrase, period. For me, this makes a lot of sense in most cases, but not always. And in this case, it would mean that bars one through four couldn't be a phrase of their own, since they end not on one or five, but on four. This forces us then to hear an 8-bar phrase ending with one cadence, a PAC, at the very end. Listen again and judge for yourself. So my opinion is that the no cadence, no phrase idea is a useful guideline, but too rigid to be a universal rule. Another debate asks whether we can have authentic cadences with inverted dominance. Listen to this phrase from Schubert's song Die Krea, or The Crow, and ask yourself whether the 3-2-1 descent into tonic, which appears in the bass voice and in the sung part, ask yourself whether it feels like a cadence.
if it sounded cadential to you, if it sounded like the kind of five-to-one motions we hear at the end of lots of phrases, then you might agree with analysts who would call this an IAC, an authentic cadence that's maybe even less perfect than the ones we saw above. But others disagree, saying this can't be any kind of authentic cadence because it lacks the bass motion. Finally, a few questions about half cadences. Namely, can inverted dominance or dominant sevenths be half cadences? Some say no, others say yes. Here in the last movement of Mozart's G minor symphony, we might be inclined to hear a half cadence in measure four, even though the dominant is in first inversion. Others might say, nope, no cadence till the PAC in the eighth bar. You decide. Our last debate asks whether you can have a half cadence with 5-7 in the classical style. For this, we have to go back to the opening of Beethoven's eighth. When you listen, ask yourself whether that fourth bar sounds and feels like a half cadence, even though the dominant has a dissonant seventh on it. Some analysts insist that this simply can't be a half cadence because it's a 5-7. But for me, that's putting definitions first and music second. I say if it sounds and feels like a half cadence, then we should probably call it one and fix our definitions accordingly. But again, you decide for yourself. So that's all I've got to say today about classical cadences. But we're going to see more cadences in the next few videos when we take a break from harmony and counterpoint to talk about some common phrase designs in classical music. I'll see you then. Mm -hmm.